Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, so welcome to session 3B, Individual paper, Papers, Journeys. Polly, feel free to start sharing your screen now. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm not a techno whiz here, but I'm so glad to be here. Um, I want to speak today about four artists who have been very influential in my life as an artist in how I approach my work at the Loom and to whom I return to for emotional guidance when I feel lost or despair that I might never again have another idea. Uh, these are compelling women, role models each in their own way. Um, and I hope that in sharing with you how their work inspires me, it might also lead to some thoughts on the nature of working with fiber and its inheritance inherent intelligence and, and what I've been hearing today, I think so many of us are all thinking about this. Um, I wanna be clear that when I speak about these women's work, I'm really looking and thinking through a metaphysical or spiritual lens, which is a lens that I'm comfortable with as the daughter of an Episcopal priest, who was my father, and a collage artist, who was my mother. I grew up in a home in which the dinner conversations and church life centered around issues most often uh, of the arts and how they relate to interfaith and the various and uniting experiences of God in whatever form he or she appears and how that is, is expressed through art. So I went to Japan twice in my 20s, the first time after graduating with a degree in art history and the second time to learn to weave. The first time I was searching, and the second time I was called in a dream to weave. So these are the, the four women I will talk about. So the first woman uh, is Sumiko Deguchi. Sumiko was the daughter of Nao Deguchi, the spiritual leader of the Omoto religion. Omoto was one of many of the new religions that emerged around the world at the turn of the 20th century. And it was founded in Japan, Kamioka, Japan, in 1892. Omoto is an offshoot of Shinto, the ancient folk religion of Japan. Shinto meaning the way of the gods, and Shinto believes in, in many gods. But Omoto is matriarchal, monotheistic, and has always encouraged interfaith co cooperation. It teaches that all gods, religions, prophets, and messengers throughout time come from the same source. Its believers practice the traditional Japanese arts, calligraphy, poetry, no drama, tea ceremony, weaving, ceramics, and, and they teach them all as a religious practice, um, a way to praise and, um, dare I say, experience God. One of the stories I've been told about Sumiko was that when she was 19 years old, she carefully and patiently unraveled a kamishimo garment and made a ball of yarn to use at the loom. Seeing this, her mother, now, um, again, was the founder of, of Omoto, said that God was guiding Sumiko's hands and by unpicking the kamishimo and reweaving the yarn into new cloth, she was symbolizing the taking apart and rebuilding of the world. In Omoto's sacred writings, the analogy of warp and weft appear, um, in weaving appears often, which is why the spiritual leaders have all practiced weaving and continue to do so today. There are many other reports in the history of, Sumi of Omoto about Sumiko's patience, humility, cheerful and calm persistence, in the face of adversity. She and her husband, Onisabro, also a fiery personality, an amazing artist, he made thousands of um, tea bowls, revolutionary tea bowls at the uh, last two years of his life. Um, but they were both imprisoned in solitary confinement for about seven years, while the Omoto temples were completely destroyed by the government. And actually, this happened twice in the history of Omoto. It was during my first trip as a student in 1978 to Omoto that in a small exhibition, I saw work by Sumiko, a small piece of sakiyori, and I was told 
that she had unraveled the threads from an old kimono and rewoven the threads into an obi. I was deeply moved that someone would have the patience to do this. Of course, at that time, I knew nothing then about weaving or even about patience. Um, Madame Naoi de Gucci, who was Sumiko's daughter, was the spiritual leader at the time of my first trip. I returned to New York to work and had three dreams over three summers in which I felt pulled back to Omoto. In the third dream, I had the vision of the weaving studio that I'd seen on my trip, my first trip. Honoring what I felt was my calling, I wrote to Madame Naohi and asked if I could apprentice to one of their, spirit, their master weavers. So my second trip to Omoto was to learn to weave. And I was there for six months between 1981 and 1982, working in the uh, weaving studio. And as you can see here on the, um, I guess can I, on the upper left-hand corner are the, all the spiritual leaders. And um, this is the current um, fifth spiritual leader still weaving today. And um, the, the uh, former spiritual leaders are all smiling down. So it's always been Sumiko though, who has, um, has called to me still after 40 years, you know, when I worry, why am I weaving? What am I doing? What is, is this worth it? Um, and somehow Sumiko always comes um, to the rescue. In between my two trips to Omoto, I worked as an office assistant to Helen Frankenthaler, which was really formative for me. Uh, an American painter and printmaker, Helen was considered having bridged the abstract expressionists of the 1950s and the color filled painters of the 1960s. Her mountains and sea of 1952 thrust her into the art world with her unique and original method of staining on pride and cap uh, unprimed canvas with veils of color. I worked in her home office on East 92nd Street in New York. From Helen, I learned how to live as an artist, the daily routine of check-in at the office, and then go down to the studio every day, no matter what. I was 22, still finding my way. I learned that being in the studio was your job. I did her accounting, cat cataloged her work, and fo followed who she was in touch with in the New York art scene at the time. Clement Greenberg, Ken Nolan, and um, Robert Motherwell, just to name a few. Uh, she was briefly married to Robert Motherwell. I did not get to spend um, that much time in her studio, which, is in, which was in an old um, firehouse on East 84th Street. But I listened to her stories about the progress of her work in the studio closely, and she continued to send me catalogs from her various shows for years after I left. What appeals to me about her work, and I think was really influential, you'll see is really influential in my own work, is that we never lose the awareness of the texture of the surface on which she is staining and painting. The woven structure of the cotton duck reveals the, the acrylic stain and the color is fused to the surface as though it were almost dyed. In the stain is her freedom to let color drive the work with the expanse of gesture. In a way, her uh, most important, the most ex important expressions of her awareness and respect of the surface is in her woodcuts. Woodcuts had rarely been used by abstract artists, except for Joseph Albers. And it is in her woodcuts that she made another original contribution, but this time to printmaking. The same freedom and abandon with which she painted, she stained ink to the block. You can see that she poured and sponged color into the grain of the wood block. Helen went to Japan to study, um, to work with master woodblock carvers and printers working in the Yukioi tradition beginning in 1983, which was rather late in her career. Um, I love the abstract flow of color in combination with her direct application of paint with her thumb. She had the hands of a worker craftsman, large, strong hands with big knuckles. 
she, she really held her own with stubborn confidence in the New York art world. Helen taught me the expressive power of color and the freedom to let color bleed. Exploring ECOT has let me paint with layers of color and I was lucky to have had a brief glimpse into her life. The third woman whose work really blew me away was discovering the work of Adriana Katarina van Ries Dutel, or Adia. Um, it was during the TSA conference in LA in 2014, I was wandering around LACMA and happened upon a show called Hans Richter Encounters. Richter was a Dada artist, a painter, filmmaker, and writer. Amidst the blaring noise of Richter's film in the room, this piece was hanging serenely, shimmering on a black, uh, back wall in a cherry wood frame and beautifully lit. This work conveyed a powerful presence and just drew me over to it. It also began to make me think about how the artist's present is kept alive in the thread, almost as a memory and, and encoded as a felt sense. Adia was born in Rotterdam in 1876. She and her husband, the painter Otto van Ries, met Sophie Tabar and Hans Arp in uh, November of 1915 during an exhibition, Modern Tapestries, Embroidery, Paintings and Drawings, which was at the Gallery Tanner in Zurich. This was the year before the Cabaret Voltaire opened in Zurich in 1916 marking the beginning of the subversive and irreverent movement called Dada. Adia and Otto showed their work on the walls of the Cabaret Voltaire while on stage, artists dismantled traditional values, codes of communication with sense turned into nonsense. Having witnessed the horrors of war, the intention was to dis dis uh, deconstruct the post for, uh, First World War culture. Sophie Tabor and, and particularly Hans Arp were major active artists in the Dada movement. Tristan Zara, who read his Dada manifesto in July of 1918, called for works that are strong, straight, precise, and forever beyond understanding. Sophie, uh, Sophie and Hans collaborated between 1916 and 1918 in designing and cross-stitching their travaux um, Hans was very careful to call them travaux, uh, which reflect this manifesto. Apparently, there is some debate about who did what in some of the works, although it was Sophie whose specialty was textile design, who introduced Hans to different materials. And I think it's interesting to note here that they used the cross stitch, which is really rather um, what, inexpressive as a, as a cross stitch. But together, they were really interested in the notion of dual authorship and of eliminating the notion of the artist as a unique creator. Dada claimed anyone could be an artist. But it seems that um, Adya really was, um, was more, um, she was more free in the way she used stitching. Adia and Otto continued to show their work at the Gallery Dada through 1918. And Gallery Dada was more traditional and upscale gallery located above a chocolate emporium um, on the West Bank of Zurich. Their work at that time was considered cubist. So here is an example of Adia's um, more calligraphic and expressive um, work and I, it's really about gesture, I think. So Adia uh, it, um, it invites close examination and the urge to touch the sensuous silk. To me, it has the perfect resolution of color and choreography, luster and softness. And for those of us who have worked in silk, we respond with a kinesthetic and muscle memory to that felt sense of her artistic voice her breath in the repetitive stitching and her presence in gesture. So many of you know Pat Hickman since she has been part of TSA in so many ways. 
vice president, president, past president, but she is a new friend and a mentor to me. Pat is another artist who work took my breath away, particularly when I saw this um, image. The scale, the delicacy, it's free form flowing and suspended. The way it captures and reflects light, boundless, borderless, porous, without traps or walls. It acts rather like a prayer as it visually defines the space through which we might contemplate freedom, release, and that great beyond. Pat speaks of her work. Labor is a big part of my work, the excessive obsessive labor, the slowing down of time, stepping out of the urgent pace of daily life. Out of seemingly nothing, something is created. In the end, the work itself is about the labor and about holding what cannot be captured, light, color, breath, and time. Even if this were not installed in a church, but in a forest and suspended from branches, one might feel either captured or rescued, a reminder of what is tenuous in that space between the knots. The way the light catches the monofilament reveals its subtle energies and claims the spirit that something magical in that space, uh, of something magical to, uh, in that space defined by the knot. In my own work with ECOT, I also use the knot to mark my breath. In the process of tying in the design onto the warp and weft, I am tying in memory, breath, and intention. In Art in America in October uh, 2014, I read this quote from Richard Tuttle in which he put in words what I have long felt. Our culture is anti-hand. It thinks better to work with your head. It thinks it's better to work with your head. Everybody aspires to go to college so they don't have to work with their hands. Yet hands are a source of intelligence. You divorce yourself from a part of your intelligence without them. People say there are just as many, if not more, neurons in the heart as in the brain. People talk about neurons in the intestines. I've not heard anyone talking about the hands having neurons. This is not new, and many artists and craftsmen would agree that it is often the material which drives the work. It takes familiarity, time, patience, and repetition. But I'm interested in this dialogue between the fingertips and the material. What is it about a material that informs? Here in a piece of Pat's new work in which she's continuing to explore the impact of walls, borders, traps, and fences, uh, the deer mesh looks like barbed wire and our tactile response is ouch. There's no breath here. There's no freedom. It's only tension and pain. This is the sensory map of the cerebral cortex illustrating where each part of the body is processed. Sensations occur all along the body and impulses are sent up the spinal column to the brain to be processed. So any sensory input, touch, uh, touch texture, sense of heaviness or weight goes up to the sensory context, cortex. The small pink strip um, lets you know where and what it is that's, that's um, where the sensation is coming from. In neuroanatomy, the cortical homunculus, imagined as a little man in Latin, represents either the motor or the sensory distribution along the cerebral cortex of the brain. For such a small part of the brain, this tactile sensory cortex translates into very large hands as well as the tongue. And um, illustrating how many sensory neurons are in the hands, sending information to a proportionally small strip in the brain. How do we as artists respond to the intelligence of a material? I do not speak of thinking materials or smart textiles, although there are lots of really amazing smart textiles emerging in today's technical, technological innovations. I am not a scientist. For me, it is working with an awareness of its subtle energies, honoring the consciousness, trusting the process, and in touching the spirit or felt sense of the thread that we acknowledge the intelligence of the, of the thread. 
I believe it is through practice, patience, repetition, and time that the artist enters into a deep communication, um, uh, deep connection and recognition, and a place of gratitude and sort of sacred agreement, if you will, that the material in, in with the material, which allows for the full potential expression of both the material and the artist. So these women who have revealed their lives in their subtle energetic communication with textiles and thread have taught me, reaffirmed me in my work and inspired me. And they've touched my heartstrings. Thank you. And next we have John Paul Morbido and he'll be presenting Magnificat, Weaving the Queer Face of the Madonna. Hello everyone thrilled to be here and be joining this conversation. I'm John Paul Morabito. Um, I use they, them pronouns. And before we begin, I want to acknowledge that physically I'm in Chicago, which sits on the traditional homeland of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Souk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Botawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. Further, I would like to acknowledge the lineage of weaving handed down through modernism, which is the lineage to which I belong, looked beyond the Western hemisphere to develop its aesthetic and material vocabularies. Foundational figures, such as Annie Albers, Ed Rossbach, Sheila Hicks and Lenore Tawney, drew upon knowledge unearthed from pre-Columbian Andean textiles with a gaze that at times crossed over into primitivism. This paper is dedicated to my maternal grandparents, Rich and Mary Rosa. Born Cosimo and Maria Rosaria, they gave up their names and their language to build a life. Yet, like so many within the ethnic enclaves of the Bronx and Harlem, they maintained and passed on a culture. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus frutos ventris tui, Jesus, Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, Ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. The year is 1988, or 87, or 89. This is an impression of routine and not a specific moment. I'm a not yet queer kid sitting uncomfortably in a pew during a Sunday morning Catholic mass. The heads that tower above me are sporting massive perms with dark, with dark curls that contrast the bright teals, magentas, and yellows of their satin blouses. These are the children of immigrants. They have traded the somber blacks and head coverings of the old world for something a bit more glamorous. They're all wearing too much perfume, and the mixture of synthetic botanical aromas is at once nauseating and intoxicating. I wish that I too could wear all those perfumes and smell like too many flowers. Needless to say, I'm not paying attention to the ritual of mass. Rather than listening to the liturgical orations, I feign piety to stare into the depths of the nearby stained glass windows. My young eyes seek out the Madonna and staring into her glowing figure, time melts away. I am approaching the Madonna with queer and ethnic sensibilities. As Susan Sontag states, quote, a sensibility as distinct from an idea is one of the hardest things to talk about, end quote. Sensibilities are expressions of the ineffable. At the point in which they become tangible and concrete, they are no longer sensibilities. They've hardened into ideas. I am using sensibilities to articulate an idea. My work is not about queerness or Italian Americanness. Rather, the Magnifica tapestries discussed here are queer and Italian American works about the Madonna. The decadence and perhaps campy opulence of the tapestries can certainly be read as queer, but it equally reflects the sensibilities of a multi-generational Italian immigrant third culture. Bronx Italian fashion and home decor is so exaggeratedly opulent that it often crosses over into the synthetic. This, this excessive aesthetic is my native language. I take such decorative frivolity very seriously in my tapestries and further employ the associations of the medium to invoke and position my queer and ethnic sensibilities. Even amidst a contemporary renaissance, 
the positionality of tapestry is marginalized. In particular, the pictorial, figurative, and narrative tapestries so strongly associated with the medium enjoy about as much esteem as secondhand clothing. In the Renaissance, tapestry was considered the art of kings, and it is perhaps because of this association with the aristocracy, alongside the industrialization of weaving, that tapestry is situated tangentially. In my weaving, I draw upon this fall from glory as a catalyst for meaning. The medium of tapestry presents an opportunity to queer sacred iconography by engaging the very traditions in which weaving has encompassed narrative and image. At the height of its glory, tapestry would have been a dazzling medium that brought the liturgies and high rituals to life in an extraordinary collective vision materialized above the heads of the parishioners. The pliability of cloth, as Arthur Danto describes, is capable of immediate interaction with drafts and light that would have lent motility to the woven figures, transforming a tapestry into a proto-motion picture. Quote, the surfaces of the images would form a kind of shimmering, undulating veil through which one could view the figures performing the miraculous acts the text describes. The tapestries would have a life not found in paintings, just because of the way they would stir in the rising heat and reflect the dazzle of taper light. The effect would be illusory in a way that painting was not capable of, and the silk, gold and silver would contribute to an effect available only by means of a hanging heavy cloth shot through with metallic threads." End quote. Considering this activation in the original context, Renaissance tapestries would have been living forms that integrated and transcended the individual contributions of the weavers and painters who created them. In the Renaissance, tapestries were produced within a system of international trade where painters authored works woven by master artisans. One such collaboration is the Acts of the Apostles, a series of nine tapestries designed by Raphael and woven in the workshop of Pieter van Aylst. It took the workshop five years to weave the Acts of the Apostles, which would hang in the Sistine Chapel. Despite all this, it is the cartoons painted and drawn by Raphael that are considered of greater value today. Symbolic and economic significance are ascribed to the Raphael cartoons because of the medium and the presumed connection to Raphael's genius. These assignations of value reinforce hegemonies embedded in the canon. Therefore, tapestry is an ideal medium to complicate the implicit hierarchies between weaving and painting. As Raphael used painting to author tapestries, so have I used his paintings to create woven images. Named for the Canticle of Mary, the Magnifica tapestries are remediations of Italian Renaissance paintings of the Madonna and Child. In Magnificat, the sacred, high Renaissance image serves as the underpainting upon which I work, immediately composing a new image from the ashes of the original. The woven Madonna is rendered with flamboyant and discordant colors, pushing the icon out of, out of classicism and into an abstract and digital landscape. Here, I employ emergent technologies in concert with handmaking, thereby yielding form that passes simultaneously as old world craft and a new media process. The work is both and neither. In an effort to heighten this dialogue between the digital and the traditional, I assert the visuality of the weave structures themselves and create secondary images. Alternating woven diagonals form chevrons, zigzags, meanders, according to the structure of the original image. These resulting patterns simulate the digital noise of a screen while drawing classical figuration into an abstraction born of the tectonic grid of the textile. It is that very tectonic grid which Cesar Petonosto credits, perhaps heretically, as the progenitor of abstraction. He observes that the patterns and motifs which naturally emerged from weaving would have left a preeminent conceptual imprint that guided ancient form making. Chevrons, Vs, zigzags, Ms, nets, checkerboards, meanders, triangles, and hourglass profiles found carved into stone or molded in clay are all forms of plectogenic origin. That is to say, they're compositions that conform to the tectonic restraints of weaving. Returning to the digital age, I have set these very patterns to dance around the Madonna 
as a suggestion, or perhaps more radically as a reminder that the tapestry precedes the painting. In a subversion of the classic relationship between weavers and painters, I employ Renaissance paintings as cartoons that I render faithlessly. This rests on mediated improvisation. In my weaving, mediation becomes immediate through submission to the systematic limitations of the loom. Once there, I can work freely. In her writing on tapestry, Ani Albers advocates for immediacy in textile form making. Quote, it is artwork, and as in other plastic arts, it demands the most direct, that is the least impeded response of material and technique to the hand of the maker, the one who here transforms matter into meaning, end quote. I employ this approach as a strategy to produce woven live form. Scholar Jenny Sorkin describes live form as the artist's body producing an immediate form in real time. To realize this at the loom, I engage an oxymoronic union that merges the predictable logic of digital weaving with improvisational making. Introducing the mixture of colorful threads live at the loom, I actively mutate the painting into an image that recalls its origin even as it becomes something new. The original paintings belong to the Italian tradition of envisioning the Madonna and child in terms appropriated from life. This envisioning, transformed in my tapestries, presents a digital age realism and with it hypermediacy. Moments of carefully rendered modeling recall painterly realism within the woven image, only to be interrupted by digital noise, chromatic striations, and the geometric patterning of weaves that obscures the figures. I have chosen to engage an era when symbolism was transformed into realism. This was surely a radical moment, and yet, to a sophisticated modern eye, it has become retrograde. Figurative realism does not hold the wonder it once did, yet it requires a concrete application of skill and work ethic. This is a sensibility that my grandparents, lacking a high school education, would have been able to understand and value. It is within this ethnic sensibility that the work originates. Like that of many Bronx Italians, my childhood was surrounded by images of the Madonna and Catholic devotion. I recall sitting in extravagant churches, surrounded by panels of stained glass that filtered the sunlight as if it were divine. Here, my eyes were drawn to the Madonna. Marian devotion is hardly uncommon. However, my turning reflected more than devotion. God and Christ, offered no welcome to a queer child, but the mother of God did. Mary always exists relationally and in her divine image provides a haven to the outcast and downtrodden. This is something that neither God nor Christ can ever achieve. As a figure, Mary the mother of God walks the line between humanity and divinity. Her image, the Madonna, has been the subject of art for 16 centuries. In such representations, the Madonna bears her humanity merging the devotional icon with life. My reworking of these icons centuries later into tapestries introduces another kind of humanity to the image, one that bears my queerness. With Magnificat, I draw upon the work of the great masters to complicate, infiltrate, and reclaim my cultural legacy. As the queer child of an Italian-American immigrant family, the Italian Renaissance is a heritage that represents an orthodoxy from which I have been ostracized. The Italian people have been Catholic for 2000 years. This is a bond I cannot and will not deny. Responding aesthetically, I activate divested illusions to Catholic opulence within the woven image and extend it beyond the picture plane. Glass beads adorn the top and bottom borders of the tapestries with shimmering fake gold that evokes the splendor and fall of the Catholic empire. The decadence of this fallen majesty mirrors the sincerity of faith with the unnatural sensibilities of camp. These sensibilities, whether belonging to my grandmother's domestic recreation of the Vatican or the exaggerated glamour of a drag queen, simultaneously engage queerness, ethnicity, and the sacred. As camp exalts what has been devalued, I employ the fallen glory of tapestry to reorient these holy images within queer cosmology, temporality, and sensibility. The tapestry that becomes the painting but simultaneously is not the painting, is performing an innately queer gesture. It is a pseudomorphosis. As David Getze suggests, pseudomorphosis and mimetics function as queer strategies of form making. Quote, infiltration, camouflage, and opacity must be embraced. It is a matter of survival, of thriving and of resistance to have at one's disposal tactics of dissemblance, 
duplicity, masking, camouflage, and code switching. The experience of being told one is outside the normal produces an activated relationship to resemblance, to recognizability and divisibility. Consequently, queer practices of looking like are endemic and sophisticated, end quote. We can, um, we can understand mutational mimetics as a methodology of queer art that is transformationally akin to drag. Imagine for a moment the theatricality of a drag impersonation of Diana Ross performing on Coming Out. Her sequin gown glitters underneath the lights and the curls of her massive wig bounce as she ventriloquistically moves her lips in sync to the song. The queen does not become Diana Ross, but rather creates a remediation through prosthetic costuming and poetic performance. Drag reconstructs a form onto one's own body and presents a simultaneous undoing that imagines an other beyond, in another time and elsewhere. This undoing is a form of negation that functions as a modality of the possible, while it emerges out of a queer performance subculture Renata Lorenz positions drag as a set of queer artistic methods which can be manifested through various formats. Accordingly, my Magnificat tapestries are digitally woven manifestations of drag. As remediations, they reconstruct religious paintings onto their own thread bodies, like effigies or fetishes that mirror the reconstruction of sacred ideology onto a queer body. The woven images locate the Madonna icon within the political space of transtemporal and abstract drag. Through a combination of visual decadence and art historical retracing, Magnificat manifests temporal drag. Temporal drag is a phenomenon identified by Elizabeth Freeman, which disrupts normativity with a chronal puncturing that subjectively draws the past into the present moment. A corollary to the better known glittering gender play, this temporal drag connotes all of the associations the word drag has with retrogression, delay, and the pull of the past on the present. In my tapestries, Catholicism exerts an ethnic gravitational pull that is aesthetically emphasized and further intensified by the retrogression toward high Renaissance figurative realism. The tapestries I weave today retrace art historical images to parody and blaspheme their piety. These woven Madonna icons register the co-presence of Italian painterly modeling and digital mediation with aesthetic sensibilities that are simultaneously ethnic and queer. This serves to unsituate the images from a fixed relationship to the present future past, thereby opening temporal transitivity as a new pathway for meaning. Where Freeman positions temporal drag to channel the political tensions and possibilities of a prior generation, I am riding the undertow back through the centuries to reimagine their sensibilities. This reimagining is realized through aesthetic and material mutations that pull 500 year old paintings into the here and now. The Magnificat tapestries anachronistically waver between the ancient and the modern, clearly occupying both temporalities. My intention through transtemporal and abstract drag is to present an undoing, a negation that is a modality of the possible. To imagine something that never was and could not be. This is a gesture of faith, hope, and imagination rooted in the criticality of queer utopia. José Esteban Muñoz suggests futurity of queer time is a utopia found in a horizon that interrupts the here and now with the potentiality of the then and there. Quote, queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future." End quote. If queerness is a horizon that has not yet arrived, then Magnificat stands at that horizon to imagine new icons of the past in the present. I would argue that such a gesture of imagination is a gesture of desire. Utopian queerness, as described by Munoz, is a formation based on a desiring directed at moments that burn with anticipation. The desire manifested in the tapestries is not erotic. Rather, it is an ecstatic and futile reaching for God. This is mournful and queer in its failure. The woven parody of the painting is an impossibility. We know the painting. We know the tapestry is not the painting. Just as we know, the drag queen is not Diana Ross. However, through such impossibilities, new potentialities are suggested. 
We simply need to shift our gaze to see them. Munoz tells us that accessing queer visuality will require us to squint, to strain our vision and force it to see otherwise. This queer squinting is a looking toward the future dawning. It is a playful and childlike attempt to see what is not there. And so, for a moment, I'll become that not yet queer kid again, sitting in a pew. Fidgeting, I look up to the stained glass Madonna. Light filters through her icon and I squint my eyes. All I can see is the colorful light and it sparkles like disco queen sequins. Thank you. Next we have Sonia Samad presenting Unraveling Stories Through Stitches. Hi everyone. <clears throat> my name is Sonia Samad. I'm an artist, <clears throat> researcher, collector of Pakistani textiles, and a mother. <clears throat> Thank you TSA for giving me the opportunity to share my visual stories embedded in memories through my artwork. Today I will be talking a little bit about myself, my life story, and my process while I show you some of my work. The stories of past, present, and future keep me an immigrant artist connected to two worlds, my homeland, Pakistan, and my new home, America. My art practice looks at the relationship between memory, immigration, and the individual and collective role of women. When artists share images and tell stories, they illustrate their struggle, and that has the power to win over broad audiences. Art provides new understanding of our memory, history, culture, and society. It, allow, it allows us to tell multidimensional, complex stories about who we are. Through art, we can represent ourselves in our full humanity and thus reclaim our identity. In my practice, this question is repeatedly asked and answered. As Haig Chien said, Memory engaging with the past in the present informs our understanding of who we are. It can provide us with feelings of belonging. People immigrate for many reasons, social, political, religious, racial, and family. Regardless, all immigrants become custodians of their homeland culture, customs, and traditions in their new land. They try to create their homelands within the domestic walls of their new home. For me, this process of immigration has allowed a new perspective on my practice of needlework. I am from Pakistan, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about Pakistan. <clears throat> Pakistan is a multi-ethnic country located on the western border of India and the eastern borders of Iran and Afghanistan. It was partitioned from India in 1947, while simultaneously gaining independence from the British. Several wars have been fought between India and Pakistan over their control of the territory Kashmir, which is my ancestral homeland. Pakistan has also seen conflict that had spilled over from neighboring Afghanistan for the last 45 years. The land has a rich history of conquest and forced migration, which has contributed to its diversity. As such, norms and values vary significantly across the country and the region and the provinces are quite distinguished from one another. The vast ethnic and religious diversity presents certain difficulties when trying to identify consistent, cult consistent cultural practices, religious beliefs, and social values. The country can be best be described as a cultural mosaic where conservatism and traditionalism reside side by side with secularism and liberalism, much like United States, which was also built on a history of revolution, forced migration, and pluralism. Thus, while my work is seemingly about Pakistan, I think it is also about America. <clears throat> I came to America in 2004, three years after 9-11. In 
It was a complicated time for an immigrant of Pakistani descent. Our identities were being questioned and demonized. In order to understand this increasingly uncomfortable situation and locate my role as an artist, I began interviewing women who came to America from Pakistan during the 70s and 80s. I felt they must have known America when it was less hostile to people like me. I wanted to know how they were feeling in the current political environment of America and do they have sense of loss? How did 9-11 change their connection to their homeland? None of them wanted to be called terrorist. All of them were responsible, tax-paying citizens in America. Textiles, food, and clothes reminded them of home, and they felt a sense of pride wearing Pakistani clothes. They tried to assimilate while keeping their homeland culture alive. I, will, I was also trying to locate a group of Pakistani women who were practicing art of needle work here. Surprisingly, none were there. And also, almost all the women I interviewed didn't know how to embroider. One of the interviewees, an Urdu language professor, said, and I quote, the female space where the practice of needlework constituted a creative as well as useful activity produced an environment in which women could freely and creatively express themselves without being encumbered by the male gaze. The work they did was for themselves, the choices of materials and mediums they're of their own. This independence that women experienced has been lost to the generation that followed them. The question arises, should we attempt to create this space as a new feminist venture or abandon it to the chronicles of memory? And I decided to reclaim my space of creativity. I was born and raised in the city of Lahore in a traditional joint family system. This inculcated an appreciation for crafts and the value and for the value of the handmaid. Embroidery seemed to provide a unique feminine form of expression, existing as it did almost entirely within the domestic sphere and practices exclusively by the women of my home. My grandmother, mother, and aunt's favorite pastime was sitting together, creating beautiful embroideries with a variety of practical and sacred functions. Clothes for a newborn, a wedding dress, a monogram for a handkerchief, their artist studio was a courtyard of our house, surrounded by us playing their, by us, their hands puncturing the fabric delicately to embroider hope, love, and wishes for our future. While telling us stories, I quietly observed all of this without realizing that one day this technique will become a tool of artistic expression and inquiry for me. I entered the National College of Arts Lahore intending to study textile as an industrial design. Along the way, I learned that embroidery in South Asia, including Pakistan, had a centuries old heritage, but it was not considered an art form in the academy. In my home, on the other hand, it had been very much tied to a very deep kind of expression, one with a particularly feminine form. Understanding its power through these experiences, I came to see embroidery as an ideal form of feminine artistic expression. After college, I attended Goldsmiths in the UK to further my understanding of textile as an art form. Rosecca Parker writes in her book, The Subversive Stitch, embroidery and making of the feminine 
because of its history and associations. It evokes and inculcates femininity in the embroiderer. But it can also lead people, women to an awareness of the extraordinary constraints of femininity, providing at times a means of negotiating them, and at other times provoking the desire to escape. In 2004, I migrated to America after getting married and soon realized that I had gone from one patriarchal society to another. My new identity and my hope to stay connected to Pakistan provided me an impetus to begin embroidery in my studio practice. Even when the design at hand has no straightforward message, the act of embroidery can feel transgressive in its silence and domesticity. It is a haven from new news worlds and internet noise, a return to a female tradition when our bodies and minds feel so keenly under assault. I started the shirt series in, entitled Be Sinful Women. This is the uh, first shirt I embroidered in America. The name is borrowed from an Urdu poem by Kishwar Nahid about the refusal by Pakistani women to accept the injustice of the Hadood ordinance that governed women's conduct in society. I started by embroidering the image of human heart in black cotton thread on my mother's shirt, my shirt, These are the details and my daughter's shirt, each with a different stitch, creating a chain of family connection. I then began to ask friends for their shirts to embroider with the black heart. All the shirts in the series are from Pakistani immigrant, except my daughter who was born here. From one friend I received a firin from Kashmir. As an ethnic Kashmiri, I thought fate was asking me to raise a voice for the Kashmiri people who have, who have suffered greatly in the midst of the territorial dispute between Pakistan and India. The first three shirts were part of a group show titled, Leave Your Swords at the Door, a collection of works by Muslim and Jewish artists focusing on identity and forming bonds with the other. In this piece, I wanted to celebrate strong, fearless women from Pakistan. The pro and the process brought me very uh, close to the owner of these shirts. The shirts are like flags holding the identity of its wearer. The finished image of the embroidered shirt evokes contradictory messages. The heart is the house of all emotions, while the color black symbolizes mourning, sorrow, and sadness, but also a protection from an evil eye. The work is an ongoing project. I'm, I'm still getting shirts, I'm collecting them, and slowly on every shirt, a black heart will appear. The fabric and the threads thread are the continuous letter to those women and to the women of the world. When I'm embroidering a shirt, I feel I'm talking to that woman, sharing her stories and telling her mine. This restores my feeling of belonging to a clan, which was lost because of the migration. Immigrants are consistently faced with the challenge of resolving tension between two diverse cultures, I belong to no land, one, was a response to the dilemma of an immigrant who's far away from her homeland. Textile work resembles meditation. For me, it is. The embroidered image of black cat strolling on a Pakistani flag is a reflection on the fractious and violent sectarian environment of the country. Black cats are considered a curse, much like the sectarian politics of Pakistan. I still remember when I made the first sketch, 
the artisan I work with in Pakistani, Pakistan, told me that this is not a good image to put on our country's flag. And then I thought I should have done another one with black cat, sorry, black cats embroidered on the American flag, given the similarities between the two countries. Elephant heart, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I have heard Pakistan is about the human perception of strangeness, absurdity, and impossibility. The elephant, which is cut from a cushion I bought from home goods that was a mass produced in India, was patchwork patched on a black velvet on top of a heavy beaded heart, represents the colonization of South Asian craft practices and my effort to reclaim them. The Pakistani flag symbolizes the ever-present power of the state that oversees these relationships. It's at the corner. The glass beads stitched into the background creates a feeling of movement and continuity. Together, these elements speak to the absurdity inherent in the interrelationship between the economy, state power, and individual life. <clears throat> Language and poetry keep me, connected, keep me connected to my homeland and help me, help me navigate in my new home. My embroideries are a form of oral history, distilled through my imag imagination and translation, connecting the text and textile. See me, uh, send me your blessing, was based on a Urdu poem by Zara Niga by the same name, about a woman who was raped in Pakistan during the Soviet, Afghan Soviet war. As a staging area for United States led operations in the war, Pakistan suffered greatly along with Afghanistan during this conflict and the repercussions continue to be felt in the continued rise of the religious fundamentalism in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. In the poem, the parrot who was taught by the woman to get, sing a devotional song, sings the song while he witnesses her mother. Here, the brightly colored parrot idly stand, witness to the field of black hearts. Garden of Hope. I'll keep on making it is inspired by a traditional Kashmiri embroidery pattern for shawls. Kashmir has been the focus of conflict between India and Pakistan since they were created. And the Kashmiri people who are caught between these powers are suffering greatly. The stylized lotus, The stylized lotus flower, the color of saffron and the turquoise background representing water together create the image of an imaginary garden. Arundhati Roy, the Indian writer and activist who has stood for the rights of the Kashmiri people said, this is not what we, this is not what we do. Even if we lose, we're not going to be on the other side. The opposite of hope is not hopelessness. Between them is a field, that's where I live and water my garden. My embroidered shawl is my depiction of that garden. To be worn by anyone who's seeking human rights and is in between hope and hopelessness. And um, the next slides, um, are just my work. Um, I want to re uh, recite a poem while showing you this work. Um, rather than talking about the work, I, uh, this is, uh, I thought was more appropriate. Here I would like to, and uh, this is a poem by Fahmi Darias. All the goblets, wine cups, rubies and gems. I sit hiding them in the hem of hiding them in the hem of my garment. 
all are still whole, intact. I sit in a world of my own. This delicate pearl of honor and faith, this crystal statuette, this crimson lotus of the heart's goblet, which is full of red wine always. Not a crack on them, nor are they scratched. Just observe their merits. They glitter as they did before and glow with the same luminosity. They had been stoned from all sides. The world had collided with them. But see how two women, womanly worms withstood the attack of every stone. And um, this work was displayed in Lahore Biennale and in Islamabad in Pakistan last year. Um, this is another piece I did. Um, um, I wanted to, and I want to finish my presentation here and want to acknowledge the, the artisan I work I, uh, with, uh, with in Pakistan every year. Um, I go to Pakistan twice a year. Um, all my summer I spend there. Um, and this is the person. Um, he's a master craftsman. And uh, I, when I'm there, I have a small studio. So I design, we discuss the work, but he provides the labor. But he also participates in the process. Um, Thank you for everyone. I think I completed uh, earlier than my given time. Um, and so now is a question and answer portion. So for all the attendees, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A, um, which is separate from the chat, just so it's a little easier to aggregate them. Um, and so far we have two questions, both from Sarah. So I'll start with the first one, which is for Deborah. Um, she says, let me put that live so you all can see it too. Okay, great. Um, that was beautiful and astute. I'd like to know if you consider a future trip to Western Armenia a necessary part of your research process, or if you think of Armenian diasporic textiles as being somewhat separate tradition. And relatedly, are you seeing current dangers to the lives and histories of these textiles in hostilities from Azerbaijan and <laughs> Turkey against Nagoro and Karabakh, I laugh at my own pronunciation. So Deborah, if you'd like to take that question. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I do consider it one tradition. I see it as a tradition that literally broke off into branches uh, at the time of the genocide, much like the people scattered all over the world. And unfortunately, in the branch that I am a descendant of, that tradition is really fading and it's almost gone. So I do consider traveling to Armenia and to Turkey a part of my research. It's almost like I'm following a thread home and trying to understand my own heritage and rekindle the kind of knowledge that um, comes with that handwork through the body in an embodied way. And of course, War is perilous for humans and animals and the land and, of course, cultural traditions. So certainly what happened 120 years ago, um, you know, hopefully won't happen again, but it is a perilous time. Thank you so much for that, Deborah. And the next question um, is for John Paul. And it's also from Sarah. Um, her question is, your work is beautiful and so shiny. 
I'd like to hear more about your use of queer decadence. It's a fierce loyalty to the artificial and also an evo a, a, a vocation, excuse me, dyslexic, um, of the outmoded morals of an empire in decline. Is it relevant to you that Raphael designed the lives of the apostles under the dwindling papal, papal empire of Leo X, or are you more interested in later critical receptions of the tapestries? So I'm deeply interested in both. Like I, I love that Pope Leo is, um, is a, a Medici and basically the king appointed himself as Pope and then had these tapestries designed to line the walls of the Sistine Chapel. I also love a bit of the antagonism that like Michelangelo and Raphael didn't like one another and Raphael's tapestries are going to like line the lower portion of the Sistine Chapel um, after Michelangelo did it. So like I, it's like a soap opera, which I really thoroughly enjoy. Um, and I think that kind of adds a little bit of like queer brevity to it as well. Um, I mean, in, in terms of opulence, like I, I think the kind of opulence that I'm re referring to is an opulence in decline. It's a, it's an opulence of an immigrant culture. So, you know, rather than having solid gold statues, there'll be fake gold statues or, um, there'll be walls of, of, um, glass blocks and things. And, you know, like I'm wearing leopard print today in, in honor of that same kind of aesthetic sensibility that comes out of, um, that comes out of both this kind of like queer space, but also definitely that, that declining culture. Um, and I, I love that it's synthetic and kind of a bit of a dramedy. That was a great answer. Thank you for that. That was a great question. Um, while we wait to see if anyone else has some questions, um, I actually have a question for Polly. I actually have two questions for Polly. So um, first, I'd just like to thank you for sort of acknowledging the fact that we all need to fill our wells with imagery and um, literature and all of the things that kind of feed our souls and allow us to keep creating. So thank you for acknowledging that. And so that kind of leads to my first question, which is that, um, you know, we live in an increasingly secular world, at least here in the United States. And so I was curious if you've received any sort of pushback for sort of acknowledging the spiritual underpinnings to your work um, and what the reception for that has been like. You know, I've just begun to really talk about this um, and to pull together my thoughts, even though they've been in my head for a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to, to have had the opportunity to put, pull them together and to share them. And I would love more feedback. But I think it's really interesting sort of how we've all skirted around issues in this, this, in this panel of, of the sacred and of... of um, our heritage and what influences there are. Because for me, you know, white, uh, uh, waspy <laughs> person having all these other influences has, it, it's, 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 it's interesting to me that the Japanese thread has come through all along, even though I don't have any real um, ties there, obviously. So thank you for that. Yeah, Deborah, do you have something you'd like to say to that? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, I've been teaching for 25 years at California College of the Arts, and I have noticed a distinct change through the years, a shift. Um, and I even noted it to my graduate seminar this semester, a couple of weeks ago. And that is students and faculty seem less uncomfortable or more comfortable with talking about the spiritual or the sacred or the <clears throat> kind of um, ancestral lineages that bring along with them the sacred. Uh, they seem more comfortable, more interested. People use the word spirituality, and that was a word that was absolutely <laughs> verboten a few years ago. So there's, I mean, I had some interesting encounters um, years ago where, where students were really shut down around that, no matter what their religious practice was whether it was Christian or you know, Muslim. And I think, I think there's been a, a, a somewhat of a change for a variety of reasons. One of them is that the sort of inclusiveness that we 
we pursue in terms of religious inclusiveness, and that has allowed a kind of burgeoning, you know, opening. There's an opening that's happening, and I'm really happy about it because so many people's work was undercover spiritual, right? They were camouflaging those motivations and that content in their work and now it seems to be an open conversation and I'm really pleased with that um, evolution really of the conversation. Thank you so much for that yeah I completely agree actually and you know because all of your work sort of touched on this like Polly mentioned John Paul or Sonia do you feel like there's anything that you'd like to add to the conversation there's no pressure I'm just curious John Paul please. I, I would I would agree with the observation that Depper is making about this shift towards um, a more openness to spirituality, but just like in general, there seems to be, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an educator as well, and so I'm, I'm seeing this shift towards people engaging with the subjectivity a lot more um, and the emotional qualities of things, and that tends to lead towards the spiritual or towards the familial um, and it's being done in such a way so that it is reaching outward and it is, um, it is engaging in conversations that become meaningful for people outside of the self. But there seems to really be an impulse towards that. And I think in many ways, it's a response to this kind of antagonistic political moment that we're in, in which people are going back into like, who am I? Where do I come from? And how, how does that, um, how does that offer a way for me to create catharsis and meaning for people that I've never met. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree with John and the rest of the two panelists. I feel that um, um, I came here in 2004 and since then, this has been my question to myself, who am I? I mean, there's so many identities and I so many hats I wear. I'm a Muslim, I'm a woman, I'm a Pakistani, I'm American. When I am here, I am not an American. When I'm in Pakistan, I'm American, I'm not Pakistani anymore. Uh, so that really makes me question my identity. But the thing which I am comfortable with over here in America is I can do that easily and enjoy it and share it, uh, which I don't know being in Pakistan, how will I how I'll do it? Or maybe if I'm there, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing, being an immigrant, um, your mindset changes. When I am in America, I, I look at things differently. Uh, and when I go back, and I go back to, twice a year to Pakistan and spend quite some time over there, um, it's, the perception changes. Um, so yes, um, I guess, uh, I'm becoming more spiritual because of that uh, constant migration. It hasn't stopped the constant displacement of my, uh, my emotions. Um, I cannot, uh, when I'm in Pakistan, somehow I cannot do embroidery with my hands. Uh, whenever I do embroidery, I always do it here in America. When I'm in Pakistan, I'm usually working with artisans. And initially I thought maybe because uh, you know, the, I've been working with this one particular artisan and uh, I enjoy it. And, you know, he, he's a master craftsman and he works in Zardozi is a technique he's master of. I am not very familiar with that technique. So when I want to use that technique, maybe, but I don't think so that is the reason. There is something about uh, my decision-making of doing things in a certain place and not doing it in another certain place. Um, I don't know what it is. I'm still uh, discovering and uh, still trying to find out um, my place in this world, which I have created being an immigrant. And I did it, I got married and I came here. No, it was no pressure, no social political reason except that I just got married and moved to America. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I have a question for John Paul. Do you, how, do, how does the thread guide your decision in terms of, you know, how the colors you choose and, and, and um, sort of how you're translating these Madonnas? I just think the imagery that you've done is so beautiful, but I'm wondering if, 
if you are, uh, how you sort of go about it using the thread as your text te uh, touch point. I'm, I'm, um, I don't know how familiar you are with, with jacquard weaving. Um, and thank you for this question. It's, it's always nice to talk about. The, I'm a weaver. I work on Japanese looms. I don't, <laughs> very simple weaving. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm a hand weaver too. All of my tapestries are woven by hand and I'm physically there. Um, and I, I am very committed to kind of positioning work about the jacquard as work that is hand woven, that like this is a hand tool, this is embodied, even though there's technology and there's a kind of hybridity that happens. So certainly there is this kind of starting point where I have a digital image of the painting that I break down and lay a ton of different weaves on. But I've developed a kind of hybrid weave structure that I'm able to like very freely and intuitively work with by inserting different colored threads um, while I'm physically present at the loom. So it's interesting that I have this digital file, this weave file that exists that I'm working off of and it's running the loom, but I found a way to, I can never make one of these tapestries the same way again. It will not look the same because the kind of weaves that I'm working with are composing the image through weft face weaving. And so the interaction of color is what, form, like the image that you're seeing behind you, that's not based upon like double woven, it's based upon weft weaves. And because of that, the, um, the image is rendered through the mixture of threads. And so therefore, um, I'm listening to it. It's a, it's a dialogue. So I'm weaving, something happens, I respond to it. It is very much about listening to the thread. I'm working with certain materialities because like thin wools with a lot of air in them pack down very, very heavily and simulate the look of um, discontinuous wet face tapestries from the Renaissance. And that's why I'm working with that. But um, there is a, there's a, a response to what I'm seeing and I'm working and I'm like, oh, that's hideous, but it's there, I've got to keep it, but how do I change it as I'm going? So it is a very like responding to what's happening in the moment um, and really like not being, I'm not trying to remake the image exactly. I'm trying to push it in another direction. Great, um, we have a question from Alex. A thread that, ha ha, a thread that seemed to go through each of your talks today was the idea of loss, of traditions, of family. Does this feel central to any of you or is it a side effect of your primary subject matter? Anyone like to start? Deborah, please. <clears throat> um, for me, it's definitely at the, the heart of my practice, whether my practice is writing or weaving or any other textile. <laughs> making practice. Um, I teach textile and history at uh, the college that I teach at, and primarily my focus is on how textiles are used as that thread, literally, <clears throat> excuse me, thread through history, through time, through generations, and how cultural continuity can be built by following those threads. <clears throat> and I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that um, I published a book on Julia Parker, the Native American basket weaver. And that was really the focus of the book, um, how she did that, how she transferred her knowledge outward to future generations, how she learned uh, from previous generations. And when I finished that book and I, that project, I thought to myself, you know, what am I gonna do next? What's the next big project I wanna tackle? And it occurred to me why am I not paying attention to my own traditions that were not really passed down from my great grandmother and grandmother to me? There was, a, there was a break in that tradition at my mother's level, generational level. But I realized that why not focus on my own? And I started to do that research and started to do the inventory. And it really is about moving, you know, capturing those traditions, holding on to them allowing them, of course, to um, transform and change because we're in this time, we're in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, it's definitely central. John, um, I, I, yes, it is. Um, thanks for a great question, Alex. Um, I, I think I'm coming from a, um, from a, 
Catholic imagination sense. And so a lot of what I'm um, loss and trauma and pain are the Catholic sensibility of beauty. Um, <laughs> and so, um, I mean, you know, to not to be glib, but that, that is a lot of what is motivating in, in my work is this like, well, that's beautiful. But what I find that's beautiful is representations of loss or ideas about loss or ideas about, um, about mining through that space. I think the idea of loss is becoming far more relevant in this particular moment because again, of what's going on, um, we're all under siege for many different ways. And I think there's, there's been a conversation about that as well that's running through the conversations that we've been having today about um, being under siege because of immigration, because of being under siege because of um, being exiled, being, you know, um, abomination to God. Like all of that is, I think, these are expressions of loss. And, you know, how do you, how do you make sense of them? Or how do you not make sense of them, but just process them? Um, and I think that's a, it's a major motivating factor for me beyond just the kind of glib, like, ah, it's Catholic. Yeah, um, it's uh, the sense of loss is very uh, at the heart of my work, actually, I feel. Um, and that is uh, because of migration and loss of uh, the fa community, family, um, and the home the architecture and the space and the birds and the parrots of that, the town. I miss everything. And, um, and with, with, as the time passes by, I am missing it more now because I'm realizing it is, and especially this, during this time, COVID time, I realized that it is so hard for me I, uh, to go back home. It actually is impossible at this point to go back home. Uh, I haven't been to Pakistan for almost um, a year now. And uh, actually, when I wrote this project, um, I was planning to interview people in Pakistan to include in the presentation. Um, and then COVID started and I couldn't go. So, yes, I'm feeling that lo big loss of uh, connection with, the, with my um, news, actually. I think because all my uh, work somehow it's uh, I think it's a unconscious effort. It is not or it's a sub at subconscious level. When I think of work, it's always the politics. Maybe it's the media. Um, uh, I should stop listening to TV, uh, radio or TV. That is one thing I'm really trying hard uh, to get to, and I hope that I can and read only some positive things. Um, yeah, so the sense of loss, loss is very much part of my practice here. Thank you all for that. We have a question from Vida. Um, she says first, or excuse me, they, um, these were all wonderful and personal presentations regarding who you are. Each of your works reveal how important it is to have multiple perspectives on who you are while celebrating and respecting diverse traditions that form us. I wonder how important it has been for you to walk across various identity lines and does your work help you keep your balance? It's open to anyone. It's definitely been important to me in terms of um, just, just becoming an artist and following the various people who, who've affected um, who I, who I've looked at and who I've worked with. So, um, yeah. And I also want to say about the idea of loss, you know, I think one of the, the, the really wonderful thing about working with in textiles is that thread that connects us to the community that we're all part of. And, and we can find our way back to who we are just by think, uh, um, staying in touch with the thread in whatever, however we do it. That's, Polly, you've said it so beautifully. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, whenever, uh, it, um, when I work with thread, it takes me closer, it makes me closer uh, to the people, to the landscape, to the environment, 
I I sometimes desire, not all the time. I'm very happy in America. I, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not. It's just that uh, I miss home. Sure. And uh, so... It's wonderful to, to be able to get right there just by picking up the needle and thread. I and mean, the whole stories of the stories I used to listen when I was with my grandmother and she was embroidering... All those stories just automatically comes back, and I think it's 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 a beautiful um, um, process of yeah. rewriting uh, your memories and your desires and your hopes and the, and you know. So yes, I uh, I thoroughly enjoy um, working with uh, thread. Thank you. Um. Vita, thank you. Thank you for this really great question about like identities and, and multiplicities of identities. Um, I, I think this idea of, as you say, what is it, um, walking across various identity lines, like that's a that's a major um, motivator within within my work, and it's the like the the irresolute tension is what I'm really um, dr really driven by. Like there there is no way to resolve. Um, being culturally Catholic and being queer. It, like, it's not going to happen um, ever. I, I don't care how long we go. It's just like a deep, a deep rooted antagonism that's in place and to, um, to be coming from a culture that is so deeply embedded with that and then be part of an identity group that is completely ostracized from that. Like that creates tensions that then I have to work through. Um, and I, I really appreciate being aware that we are crossing multiplicities of identity and experience. And I don't want to have to choose one or the other. And so I make work about their confrontation, um, which is sometimes seamless and more often than not pretends to be seamless, but becomes um, kind of fractured. Mm -hmm. Deborah, would you like to touch on that before I move on to the next question? There's no pressure. Just yeah. just. Briefly, I, I find myself in a constant conundrum because the, the, the needle lace tradition of the Armenian women and the Turkish women is so close, so inherently bound together. And it really points to the cultural connections between the two, certainly in the past, but also in contemporary um, society, both in Turkey um, but of course, there's so much strife, um, not only residual, but contemporary um, conflict, that it makes it really difficult to negotiate that. And I want to reach across those divides. But even when it comes to a presentation like this, I have to very carefully choose my words. Am I going to use the word genocide? Yes, I am. Am I going to use the word, you know, ethnic cleansing? You know, and I, depending on where I am at the moment and what my audience is, I, I, I have to tailor very carefully. I don't want to um, disrespect anybody or make anybody upset, but it is, it's definitely a tension, um, very much like you were talking about John Paul between these various identities that, that are connected and yet still estranged. Thank you. Thank you all for those great answers. Um, we have, one other question that's in the Q&A, but actually before I go to that, Laura sent a message in the chat that I'd just like to read out. Um, thank you all for sharing your, your intimate stories so generously with us. I think each of your narratives and especially the connections, the textiles that you make to notions of home really resonates with many of us right now as so many are missing homes, intimate spaces, families due to COVID-19. So thank you for that lovely comment, Laura, and just to acknowledge everyone's work and, and the work that they've brought to the table today. Um, the last question that we have um, is an interesting question. Um, and to be honest, I, I'm happy to have this be our last question um, since we are running close to time, but it is a little bit of a hot button topic. And so, um, as the panelists can already see it, and I think everyone can because I made it live, so I'm going to read it out. But I'd be very interested um, to hear the panelists' ideas on this, especially if there's a uh, dissenting opinion. So anyway, um, does any one of you 
ever feel like textiles have a secondary status in the larger field of creative production? Does it bother anyone that when works are made from a textile lens, they don't get as much appreciation or recognition as visual arts lens, especially in terms of the recognition one gets as a maker? Um, and I'd be especially curious to hear if anyone has a, a counterpoint argument by any chance. You don't have to have a counterpoint. I'm just putting that I can just speak briefly to that. Um, clearly that has been the history of our medium up until very recently, I would say. And I was sort of engaged in that conversation, I will say, I battled in that conversation um, in my institution to really um, achieve a kind of recognition for the program and the students who are working in and around textiles, um, the same kind of sort of understanding. Um, I would contend with comments like, you know, I, you know, from another professor, I don't understand why she's weaving this instead of painting this. Those were typical conversations that were happening 10 years ago. 15 years ago, 20 years ago. But I will say that that has really shifted and there is a growing understanding, not only that we're working in, in interdisciplinary ways, all of us in one way or another, but that textiles have a, have a long, rich history. <clears throat> you can use them to um, sort of capitalize on the meaning of the textiles a lot of my students, my graduate students now, they don't necessarily identify themselves as textile artists, but they definitely work in textiles. They take my courses, they work with me on an individual basis. And the faculty is, has been very responsive and very, there's a much more of an inclusive atmosphere. And I think that that also exists out in the contemporary art world. Thank you for taking that. Yeah, John Paul, please. And just so we know, we have about four minutes left on the panel. So. Great. Um, I mean, I, I would I would agree that there, like, I, I don't think one can say that within the Western canon, textiles have had a lofty position. I think it's it's pretty evident that's not the case. Um, certainly, things are shifting in this moment. Like, um, at, you know, at major art schools, we're seeing more and more students enroll in weaving courses and thinking about weaving formally and conceptually and in conversation with other disciplines. And you know, just with, with even in every other um, area of textile making, but I would also say like that marginality still is present, um, if not if not procedurally, then conceptually. And I kind of like to lean into that a little bit and just be like, this is a catalyst for meaning, like this history of marginalization and this history of being kind of liminally on the outside of the conversation means something. I mean, of course, I'm talking about an, an identity that kind of exists liminally, but like. I think it can become a catalyst for meaning and we can channel that as a means of having conversations. And like, let's also ask like, why have textiles been marginalized? Well, who makes textiles? Women, people of color, queer people. Like there's a reason why it's a marginalized medium and it has to do with who the makers are. I also think that, that a real problem is that galleries and you know, directors of galleries, many people out there don't really know how to talk about textiles. And so they can't, you know, they really can't sort of explain it. They can sort of look at it from a painting point of view in terms of color and how this is balanced and designed, but they really can't get in. Many that I've met have not been really informed about how to talk about textiles in the process involved. And I think that's a real problem in sort of keeping it in the second rate kind of place. Uh, I agree with Polly here that that's what I felt when I came here and started exhibiting. People will come look at the work and they will accept my work, but and it's, they will say it's beautiful and that's about it. I yeah. mean, and if I start talking about the content or the process, um, somehow not everybody's, you know, enthousi enthusiastic to to listen to the stories, but there are, there, there, there are people who want to, but there are not that many galleries of sure, of course. Um, and it is the same situation in Pakistan, by the way. Um, it is uh, the, until the end of 20th century, they did not recognize textile as a medium of expression or within uh, the medium entering into the uh, high art as, 
they would like to say. Uh, but now it has changed a lot. Many, many people are working in textiles and using it as a medium of expression. Um, but yes, the galleries need to be prepared. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, no I, no, I really appreciate your answer. And I just, I am apologizing to cut you off because I wanted to thank all of you so much for your paper and for answering these questions so thoughtfully and to you, the audience for asking such thoughtful questions and being here with us. Um, we know that your time is precious. And so thank you so much. And thank you again to the panelists and to TSA for hosting this. Um, yeah, with that, I think we'll let you guys go. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.